Okay, so we're on to the next Go and ahead. final section of our interview. Yes, ma'am. Um, what's next? Your extensive publishing career includes, to date, more than 500 authored or edited articles, books, and chapters. What else would you like to accomplish that you have not done yet? Well, my plan had been I was going to be a, you know, a, a grandmother and, and cuddle my grandchildren of half seven, and they're all grown. I mean, all, all but the eight-year-old, and, and she plays the guitar and is busy with her iPad, so I don't think I'm her, her like go-to her. person. But um, so my, my original plan for my golden years is sort of over. <laughs> my, um, I wanted to get into a more expressive kind of life. Um, that is without the boundaries of academia, because I think I was, you know, a child of reinforcement. Sure. And I kept pressing the bar, you know, building my validity list, 500 things, so I could show my mother, not my father. You know, it was, sure. it was that old stuff going on, I think, that I am my list. Um, so I have been... Uh, taking some art classes, but being way too judgmental about the quality of my work, so I take them and then stop. I have been trying to be, um, was always very, ath not athletic, because I'm not, I'm very klutzy, but I was always very active, um, running, tennis, swimming, you know, aerobics, all through my life. So I'm trying to get to what's appropriate now for me. So I've been doing some qigong, which is very helpful, and um, doing walking. And I'm going to try to make my wife have more time for that. Um, as I had alluded before, I, I really had felt for a very long time, longer than most people get to, um, feel like I was in the middle of things. I was 27 when I was 28 when I was starting, and I was immediately, you know, on a panel with the, you know, president of the University of Chicago and Mike Scriven and me. And it was like, you know, so I got pushed up, really focused on that kind of level. Now I'm, as I said, not quite on the ice flow, but thinking about it, and trying to figure out how to structure my own time and do something worthwhile. And whether that's going to be academic, I don't know. I think I'm going to try to write. I mean, we have some books in the works um, as part of our requirements right now. But I'm thinking I might want to write a book that's more... Um, that has a narrative character to it, yeah. but that could involve um, my own work somehow. Oh, I don't know if I'll be able to do that or not. But I feel like I propel myself with these little benchmarks. Like when I was on, there was a committee where um, IASA under Clinton was, a, you know, essentially the um, Title I version of that and expanded it. I was the technical advisor on the rulemaking committee. Mm. You know, I thought this is my crowning achievement. You know, it's going to change everything. No. <laughs> the standards book, I put every heart and soul into this. It's going to change everything. The answer is no. So I give myself these sort of illusory goals mm -hmm. and propel myself toward them and then get disappointed that they did. So now I'm trying to size my goals in the right way and also figure out if I can survive when the world doesn't structure my time. From 1975 on, I decided that it wasn't about my scholarship and my career as much as about Crest. And I would, there was a period of time, if you look, that there are no publications except maybe reports to the government. Sure. But um, because I was trying to figure out how to make an organization work, you know, collectively. Mm -hmm. And 
I put everything I had intellectually into that, aside from family and husbands, you know, that very important. Um, but from the academic side, that it was institution building. Then when I became not the director, which is about five years ago, it you know took me a period to get adjusted to that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, probably three years of oh, the way we used to do it was sure. drove everybody crazy. Sure. I'm sure. <laughs> sure. What impact has your research had of which you are most proud? So now it's time for me not to self-denigrate. No. But I don't know. There are things I did in writing assessment that I thought were really great. And they got picked up by other people, but not acknowledged in the sense that, oh, this came from this group. Um, It had to do with how writing was scored. And we did some work where instead of asking teachers what do you think about this essay or we ask them to write the essays mm. and then use their from like expert novice comparisons use what they did not what they said mm. as the benchmark and that was a much more mm. developed much more reliable valid measures that way I thought that was really important. It also applies to performance assessments. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that people know that it's associated with us in any any real way. And it probably doesn't matter because if they own it themselves, then they'll, you know, promote it and use it. Uh, A really smart man, uh, Dick Schutz, who used to be the um, director of the Southwest Regional Lab once told me, after I thought I had written a great paper for the American Psychological Association meeting, he said, oh, yeah, you did what all academics do. You, it's paired associates. You took common things and named it something else that would be associated with you in the literature. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's absolutely right. I'm going to try not to do that anymore. <laughs> but that's what people do. You know, I mean, they want to be known as the person who did this concept. And then somebody else makes the concept and changes it 10%, but it's a whole new name. Sure. Yeah. What would you want to be known as the person who did? I would like to be known as a person who told the truth. And I think what we were trying to do at Crest all along was to tell people what was good and not so good about the measures they were using. And that ticked off a lot of people who thought they're anti-tests. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just couldn't be the case. But, you know, it it isn't kind of a binomial deal. You're just, you, so I think the important thing for us um, working in this field are to be able to tell the truth about what it is so that you can fix it if, if it if it needs fixing and to do so with credibility and and some level of integrity that it isn't that you're just telling the truth but people believe you and that's hard i think sure okay so then this last set of questions are called introspective questions. Oh, dear. Um, Yeah, it's a list that everyone that's been interviewed on this show gets. Ready? Okay, ready. Who do you believe has had the greatest impact on you and the scholar you have become today? Bob Glazer. Bob Glazer. Perfect. What inspires you? I think I was inspired to want to achieve something, and it was partly because I was a woman. Um, And the underside of that was, oh, I was in a woman's field. But um, so much of what I did was hugely self-conscious about what it meant to do what I did as a woman. People have called me up and said, you know, we need a woman to come to a meeting. Mm -hmm. And I say, on what topic? because I had all these very smart women working for me, and they'd say, it doesn't matter, we just need a woman. From that 
kind of thinking to the, where we are now is, it, you know, it's a big leap. The society's pushed us ahead. But it was hard. It was a hard time, and it's hard to communicate to younger women now. Not that they should, you know, adore us and venerate us, but it, it was hard. It, it, it's almost unbelievable when I think about it. Throughout your whole career, too. Throughout the whole time. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, yes, yeah, she can be a distinguished professor, but how many, what's the proportion of that among men and women in your sure. university? I don't sure. know. It's not so great. Right. What do you find uninspiring? Self-aggrandizement, I think. I mean, I think there are a lot of people in our field who read their own publicity. You know, it's all about me. Mm-hmm. And while that, there's a buzz on that from time to time, mm-hmm. I think it gets old fast. And it doesn't matter whether they're young and coming up or whether they're at the pinnacle. I just find that really something I'd rather not hear about. I like that answer. What is your favorite word? My favorite word used to be eclectic because it guaranteed me about a grade up in English essay. I mean, that's... <laughs> Leave it to the assessment person to know how to game the... That's right. That's right. <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? You called it before a barnyard word. That wasn't my favorite curse word. Do you want me to say my favorite? Sure. But... <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got to edit this one out, please. Oh, no, 90% of them. We have 90%. And what do they say? That's probably the most common. What profession other than your own would you have liked to attempt? Well, I almost, while I was a professor, decided I'd go back to school and become a microbiologist. Interesting. Because I thought that's where it was going to be. You know, that... That's where one would have the greatest impact. Okay. What profession other than your own would you have never liked to attempt? I think jobs, professions slash jobs, where your boundaries are hugely limited are not things that I would like. Okay. You know? Favorite book? Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman. Okay. Favorite movie? All That Jazz. Nice. Do you know that? Love it. (laughs) If you could tell President Trump one thing, what would it be? Leave. (laughs) Perfect. I thought I was going to hear another barnyard word. No, (laughs) but that's implied. (laughs) If you could have dinner with anybody, dead or alive, who would it be? My dad. Mm. Yeah. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I'm not surprised. Nice. Finally, what advice might you offer to graduate students and beginning researchers who hope to make a contribution like you to education and educational research? I think take risks. I take no risks, very few risks in my personal life, but I take a lot of risks at work, and I think I've been rewarded for that. Um, I think... In our field, people are too conservative and too careful because they're worried about what people think. I figured when because I was a woman, people would think weird things anyhow, so it didn't much matter. (laughs) Yeah, so I think I've had the most fun thinking, sort of following novelty from time to time, trying to understand a field that's beyond me, like... AI stuff in the 70s. I was doing work in that then. And um, I should have seen boundaries, but I didn't see as many. Mm -hmm. You know, I might have had a a better career if I had followed the rules a little better. That's great. It's a perfect answer. So in closing... Yes, when asked ma'am. to capture the essence and nature of Dr. Eva Baker, your friend, colleague, and one-time teaching assistant, Dr. Edis Quilmaz, <laughs> Edis Quilmaz. Edis Quilmaz, describes you as nurturing, determined, innovative, and a role model for professional women. Notes that you have always emphasized the need for assessment to inform instructional decision-making to serve the needs of teachers and students. 
Cheryl Tyler, who worked as your administrative assistant for more than 30 years. I had brunch with her yesterday. Oh, right? I was in Edis's wedding three weeks ago. She got remarried. I was a bridesmaid. Oh, fun. <laughs> Very weird. Cheryl characterizes you as a true academic who sometimes raised issues or created situations that challenged the rules and standards. It was that creativity and ingenuity that made you stand out in your field and inspire others around you, including some very talented younger scholars. This all makes sense to how you're defining yourselves in the last in the last ten minutes. And she had to clean it up. <laughs> I mean, Cheryl was amazingly talented administrator and was, oh, you know, sure. worked in contracts and grants. She had to make it right. <laughs> sure. Dr. Robert Stake, your longtime colleague and friend, recalls his efforts to develop a casual interest inventory that could be used to create a profile of a young scholar who, based on his or her experience and interest, might work at UCLA. He characterized the profile as having an interest in standards, psychometrics, behavioral objectives, indicators, and hypothesis testing. Although you were teased by Ernie House when your results suggested an interest in case studies, responsive evaluation, and qualitative methods, you have been at UCLA now for more than five decades. Dr. Scott Marion characterizes you as a mentor, colleague, and friend as well as one of the most forward-looking people he knows. He explains that even though he is many years younger than you, he always feels like he is playing catch-up when it comes to your work on technology-based assessment. Wow. He adds that he is sure you will continue to be five to ten years ahead of the rest of us, but is always happy to try to follow your trail. Your longtime friend, Joyce Lynn, notes that you care very much about your role in advancing society's educational results. In her observation, you are determined to be the human energizer bunny. She adds that you are always ready to help anyone who needs it, including other people's grandchildren. She explains that you and Harry spent many hours of great hospitality hosting each of her sons and their sons as they, as they explored West Coast colleges. You went above and beyond. Finally, your friend and colleague, Dr. William Bill Tate, describes you as serious yet funny and notes that you are forward-looking while respecting the past. You bring toughness with empathy. You exude a balance that is rare. Also coming from your longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Randy Bennett, who captures the sentiments of all the others as well, characterizing you ultimately as a person who loves life and all it entails. That means loving your family and being there for them, doing the best you can to make a difference in the world by helping to improve how it is we educate and evaluate learners. Experiencing as much of the world and its wonderful diversity as you can, being a great friend and sharing your wisdom, experience, and wonderful nature. So, on behalf of all of us, educators, scholars, future educationists, educational researchers, and the like, we thank you, Dr. Eva Baker, for everything you do, and most importantly, for being you. Thank you. So now I realize that I didn't say anything about my husband. Okay. And I need to. Okay. I feel Let's like, that. like somebody at the Emmys who forgot to thank their <laughs> wife. <laughs> so I met Harry, um, Harry O'Neill in, um, actually met him in the 80s, but um, he was working at DARPA and supporting projects that I was somehow connected to. Um, and he was uh, working as a Fed, and I went to see him to try to get money for Crest. Oh. When Ronald Reagan was president, and I thought, no way, no domestic money, we're going to need to have military money. And I asked Merle Whitrock, who was a colleague, who do you know in the military who doesn't do work in death and dying? And he said, Harry O'Neill. So I went to see him and uh, liked him a lot. And he was doing work in um, trying to help young military people learn basic skills, because sometimes they would come in without good literacy or math skills. And so he was doing math without all the... I was had been divorced for eight years, seven years at that time. And uh, there was a question of, um, okay, so we had... Things were working out. Where were we going to live? Mm. And 
So I could have gotten a job at DARPA or at NSF, which were highly coveted jobs, but I had crest out here and also a teenage son. My daughter was at Berkeley. And he gave up quite a large empire, he calls it, you know, for with more secretaries than I had staff, uh, to move out to California to go to the university, um, which doesn't necessarily provide the most lavish environments for professors, and to become stepfather to my kids. And this is for a man who never dated a woman who had children because he didn't want to be around children. So Harry, um, aside from knowing things, and he's an example of the thing I talked about, about men who knew things. He knew more about AI than, you know, I wanted to know it all. So I learned things from him um, that are content-oriented. But I learned the most about um, confidence because I always had felt that I was doing it with mirrors and there was this empty part of me and I was faking it mm -hmm. to the world. And Harry um, has just a different life approach. He's it's all going to work out. Mm -hmm. And what he does, he values. And he does so in a completely calm way and with a lot of joy. So I've been married to him for 35 years. And, you know, I have picked some things up. Not enough, sure. but that. And so um, he and I do our work together for the Navy because he has this DOD background and they... You know, they put up with me, but they really want to sure, listen to him. Sure. And he has been um, very supportive and very uh, special, as I've had some ups and downs recently, um, and very good um, to the kids. Mm. I'll give you an example of how smart he is. He said, when we were first married, I don't know how you decided this, but... I will never help you make a decision that involves money with your children. That's your problem to do. You do it. Uh, whatever you decide is fine. Mm. That sort of set up a, an appropriate dynamic that made everything easy. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So he's, I mean, he knows, not talking about his intellectual capability or any of that, but on a personal level, he has been a model um, for me and, and our family. And, um, you know, not to get to tie it up with a, a ribbon, but a uh, therapist I had said, for your second marriage, you married your father. Interesting. Meaning, <laughs> Let's not think incest, but, yeah, right. but, you know, the calmness, the confidence that you can do anything, the safe environment. And I think that I've done the best work since I've been married to him because I've been, I've been free to take those risks without being afraid. Kind of back to your old self. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I felt I should sort of make that that loop for you, for just sure. as we're talking, not for, sure. not for the kids. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.